Uh, welcome everyone. Happy Friday and I believe Happy New Year. We are still in January. So uh, if this is your first time today joining us, uh, we're happy you're here. And if this is not your first time, please know that uh, we see you and appreciate you for your loyalty. And actually, um, since this is um, the first brown bag of the semester, I would like to take a few moments to thank you all for being with us for the last year or three years. So we started this back in fall of 2020. And I want you to know that uh, we really appreciate you. And without you, faculty and uh, instructional staff, I don't believe that we will be able to have brown bags. So for all of you who are here today for the first time and who are coming back, thank you. And I'm sure today after um, our session or during the session, you might be thinking, maybe I have something to share like her. Oh, I want to come back for those who've been here before, like Lee Murphy. <laughs> I say, I want to come back and share something different. Please reach out to me. I'm always looking for people to lead sessions and uh, Again, thank you for being here. And I'm joined today by my some of my team members. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let them introduce themselves. Um, uh, Dr. J, I believe you have a few words. Yes, thank you. I, I just first want to say thank you, Igor, for doing such a good job organizing these. And again, my heartfelt thanks to faculty for spending your time both to come and to present. It means a lot. And it really brings a significant depth and understanding for our online learning for all of us as we create a community of practice here. Um, so thank you for coming and just wanna, um, Igor may mention some of these, but I just also wanna put a little plug in for something we started in the fall. We're calling Old Cops Online Learning Community of Practice that we do midweek, twice a month. That is uh, less of a presentation, more of a, um, more of a discussion conversation uh, led by one of our staff members and so uh, the next one we have coming up is the 7th of february um and uh and then but you should see that in the in the newsletters yeah if you're not getting the newsletters we'll put a link in the chat as well and that's a great way to to, to know uh, what's going on in and through um olap and just also want to say as the Instructional designers are introducing themselves that we are here to serve you. We are here to help as much as we can. Our goal is your goal, which is to create the best online experiences for our students and to see them have the great outcomes that they have, as well as, you know, our overall mission, which is to um, reach those, uh, particularly Tennesseans that that uh, need education and wouldn't have access otherwise, which is one of the reasons why um, I'm here, and so many of us are here. So thank you for coming, and I'll pass it on. Should I pass it on to somebody, Igor, or back to you? Um, to somebody, maybe Chris Emberton. Put on the spot. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Emberton. I'm with OLAP. I'm an instructional designer. Thanks, Chris. Tina, next. Hello, everyone. I'm Christina Goog better known as Tina, and I'm also an instructional designer within OLAP. Thanks, Tina. Jason Brown. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Jason Brown. I'm the video production manager here in OLAP. Um, I'm here as part of a, the head of a team of uh, video production specialists um, here to support online education. So um, we have a brand spanking new studio. The dust is still settling on it, and we're, we're here to help in, enhance your course material and kind of bring students to places and have experiences that they wouldn't normally get to have in an online space. So um, I'm looking forward to getting to know many of you through over the course of the year. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Tanya. Hi, my name is Tanya Hussein. I'm an instructional designer and developer. At, oh, yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. At, um, Olaf, and it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Tanya. I don't think there's anybody else here. So uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker. Her, uh, her name is Dr. Nilda Romero-Hall, I believe. 
Anilda is associate professor in the learning design and technology program at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. She serves in the editorial team for the feminist pedagogy for teaching online dig digital guide and also serves as the awards chair for the AERA uh, SIG Instructional Technology. AERA is American Educational Research Association. Uh, in her research, uh, Enilda uh, is interested in the design and development of interactive multimedia, faculty and learners, digital literacy, and networked learning in online social communities. Other research areas include uh, innovative research methodologies, culture, technology, and education, and also feminist pedagogies. Uh, you can connect with her uh, here. I'm going to stick the link in the chat. So, Anilda, please take it away. Hi, um, Igor uh, and the OLAP team for um, organizing this brown bag session and having me join today. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you everyone else who's joining uh, from wherever you are, um, university, campus, or somewhere else you may be. Um, I look forward to this session. Um, I, um, I hope I'm sharing some um, new ideas and content, but if not, then um, at least I'm sharing my own practice and then you can compare it to um, your own um, online learning practices. So with that, let me go ahead and um, share my screen. Here we go. Perfect. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, Learner Center Online Course Design. Um, and as I mentioned before, these are um, some of it is my own practices, and part of this presentation is also um, a reflection on a publication that I have with some colleagues related to the design of Learner Center um, design in a learning management system, which we are um, all using as part of our connection to, um, to UTK. Um, so as Igor mentioned, my name is Dr. Nilda Romero-Hall, and I'm an associate professor in the theory and practice in teacher education department. Um, here's my email. You can feel free to connect with me. I'm also on Twitter, where I connect with um, other instructional designers, online teaching and learning practitioners, and just academics um, in general. Um, so my uh, practice in online teaching and learning um, has a foundation on um, what's called uh, critical digital pedagogy. Um, and as is defined by uh, Jesse Stomel, um, critical digital pedagogy is an approach to teaching and learning that fosters agency and empowers our learners. Um, and it really aims at um, critiquing um, oppressive power structures that we may not be aware of or that we may be aware of in our online courses. For me personally, um, critical digital pedagogy considers a series of different aspects. So first and foremost, the um, learning experience um, focuses on the practice on community and collaboration. So learners are coming into the learning experience to interact with one another, to interact with the content and interact with the instructors. It also means that um, we acknowledge, recognize and value diverse international voices so uh, we think about ways of communicating that allow for um, collaboration that happens across different cultural and political boundaries. Um, in traditional um, learning environments, we also have the learners um, put the instructor as sort of like that single voice, the center of the instruction. But um, with elements of critical pedagogy, we are 
considering the learning experience as a collective of different voices. So individuals are coming to the classroom and sharing those their experiences. Um, based on my um, experience as an instructor, I find that many students often um, are hesitant to share their experiences because they may feel that it doesn't add to the learning experience, but it's always important to encourage them to bring their own voice. Um, and then um, ideally, uh, when we integrate critical digital pedagogy into instruction, we consider the learning um, outside, uh, how it applies outside the traditional institution of education. So how is what the student is learning applicable to them in their life, in their profession, to their community, or to their society? Um, so I tend to create a connection um, to giving back to the outside world. So giving back to um, something that is outside, um, just doing it for an assignment, doing an assignment for a grade. So personally, um, I consider three elements in my critical digital pedagogy. Um, first is that three-tier design approach, which is what I'm going to cover today during the presentation. Um, I also consider um, elements of culturally relevant pedagogy because culture is such an important part of me in terms of being an instructor and an academic. And then I consider elements of feminist pedagogy because it um, helps me reflect and think on my practice as an instructor uh, with equity and inclusion for all um, in mind. But as I mentioned before, I'm gonna be focusing today on that um, three-tier design process. Before moving forward, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators, um, Wei Wei Jing, uh, who is an instructional designer at Arkansas Tech University, um, who was the lead for this publication, and my colleague, uh, Dr. Pauline Salim Muljana, um, who is a Educational Technology Program Manager at um, Digital Promise. Um, and I actually think that um, as an academic, being able to collaborate with practitioners, it just keeps me and it keeps my instructional design skills um, at a different level. So I really enjoy collaborating with uh, practitioners. Um, again, it just enhances my level of, of my practice and my teaching. Um, and this is our publication. And what I will do at the very end is that I will um, provide a link to it um, so that you can uh, save the PDF. So, but I just wanted to share it here. So the three-tier design process uh, consists of really um, key elements that um, if taking care of adequately at the beginning of the design process or at the creation of a course in a learning management system. Um, it just allows the process to run more smoothly and to keep the learner in mind as you're going through these different elements. So it starts with the design part, uh, which takes into consideration the creation of learning objectives. Um, it then moves on to thinking about the learning activities or how learning activities are um, designed. Um, there is an element of alignment, um, which just connects the learning objectives, the activities, and the assessment. And then it considers elements of accessibility. It then moves on to the development process in which the instructional language is key. How do we present content? So much of our content is presented on screen. And then it considers the organization of materials. So I'll be presenting some of my um, own course materials. And then it ends with um, communication, um, communication with the, with the instructor and communication with, the, um, with classmates. Uh, access to resources and the overall navigation of the course. So let's go ahead and get started with the design components. So 
as part of the um, design component, the first one is to consider um, the write-up of learning objectives. Um, and for this approach, I always use the SMART acronym, um, SMART referring to making sure that your learning objective is specific, is measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Um, and what that means is that you are thinking of uh, a specific, um, what are you referring to in terms of a specific? What content does the learning objective refer to? What topics or what practice? Um, measurable, how, um, how often should the learner be able to perform that um, task or, or um, how much of that content are you wanting the learner to know? And I'll provide an example in a minute. Um, achievable, uh, we want learners to you know, achieve either knowing the content or practicing a task with 100% accuracy, but is that always gonna be the case or do we wanna provide some flexibility um, like, do we want to say with 90% of accuracy? Um, relevant, um, how is it relate to the instruction that the um, learners are being, um, you know, presented with? And then time bound, um, do you want the learners to know that, uh, to reach that objective within a week, uh, within a specific module? Do you want them to achieve it within a course or do you want it to achieve it within a specific academic year? Um, so SMART makes it really hard to, makes, makes it really easy to understand um, elements of a learning objective. But um, ideally to write a good learning objective, you actually may scribble that a little bit or change the organization a little bit. So you actually start with a specific, measurable, then move on to time bound, make it relevant and make it achievable. So an example of this would be um, for my students, it would be um, learners will be able to list. That verb is really important. I want them to list. I don't want them to describe. I don't want them to define. I want them to list um, five instructional design models by the end of a specific module with 90% accuracy to increase their awareness of instructional um, design methods, right? So again, my learning objective is as specific because I want the learners to list. It's measurable because I want them to list five instructional design models is bound to a module. Um, and I want them to do this with 90% accuracy. And then I create the relevant because it relates to the content that they are covering, right? So, um, so SMART is a great way to um, consider all the elements that we hope that the students achieve within a specific um, learning objective. But I've had many conversations with colleagues, um, with learners, with instructional design students as to whether learning objectives are important or not. Um, I've actually seen this recently on our uh, Twitter community. And um, in a personal note, um, I feel that learning objectives are important for me as an instructor. Um, and also as a designer, because it gives me guidance as to where I want the instruction to go. Uh, but it also can provide uh, guidance for the students. Um, I leave this question for you to reflect on, and maybe we can talk a little bit about at the end of the conversation. Do you always present your learning objectives to the learner? Um, or do you use them yourself as a way to guide your instruction? Uh, but don't necessarily share them with the learners. Now, transitioning from objectives to learning activities, um, the learning activities are an opportunity for um, our learners to have an opportunity to practice. So as Meryl um, defined here, 
it is an opportunity to work on tasks of increasing complexity with feedback on their performance, right? So ideally, the learners are presented with some sort of instructional content, um, have a learning activity, are provided feedback, and then have an opportunity to improve on that um, learning task. So two different um, approaches that I have considered um, in my teaching of um, hybrid and online courses um, are these two options. The first one um, in which the learners are able to complete a task for practice. Um, so for example, I've taught my multimedia development course in the past and students have to um, create an infographic for um, a practice task. And um, during that infographic creation process, they, um, learn about the tool that they're going to use, the software that they're going to use. Um, they practice the data collection process and ways in which they can present that content in a way that, way that is instructional. Then they re receive feedback on the task and then they get to complete a similar task for a final submission. So they get to go through the process of creating an infographic again, um, but now with the opportunity, having the opportunity to receive feedback and practice on it. Um, in other in instances, tasks that may require a longer um, commitment period, so a, a maybe perhaps a semester long uh, process, um, you know, the students may be asked to write um, an instructional design approach to a problem that is occurring. And that is a pretty big project, right? Um, they have to write the problem statement, they have to do their learner's analysis, um, they have to complete a task analysis. So there are multiple layers to this assignment. So instead of saying, well, here's your assignment and it's posted for the very end of the semester and it's due on such and such day, um, what I like to do is I like to break the task into um, deliverables that are done throughout the semester, giving the student the opportunity to complete a portion of the assignment, receive feedback, um, resubmit the revised version, add another portion of the assignment, and go through the process until all the elements of the task are completed. So again, it refers back to this idea that learners have an opportunity to work on tasks of increasing complex complexity uh, while getting feedback on their performance. Um, so once as an instructor, I have connected my learning objectives with my um, learning activities, then um, something that I have done in the past is the creation of a table of alignment. So the table of alignment is a great um, practice when you are either teaching a course for the very first time and you're thinking through the process of developing this course from beginning to end, or you may be teaching a course that you have never thought before. So it's a completely different um, topic for you, or you're just teaching for the very first time. So in the table of alignment, you may have different levels of learning objective. So there may be some course objectives, and then there may be some module of like, um, objectives. And then you're ensuring that you are connecting your learning objectives with the assessment and the learning activities. Um, so the last thing you want is your students to say, well, I, we never covered that, that uh, questions or assessment um, in the content, right? So this is completely disconnected. How does this relate to the content that I just read? So again, um, a table of alignment just allows that, um, you know, smooth transition between all these elements, learning objectives, assessment, and the learning activity. Um, and in the past, actually, as part of getting my courses uh, review for online teaching, I have had to create an entire table of alignment 
uh, for a course. And I found it to be, um, you know, rewarding because it just allowed me to have a full idea of what I was designing before touching the LMS, um, before putting content on the learning management system. So key takeaways to consider in terms of um, design um, and practices that have been useful to me is combining your course syllabus uh, with your course calendar in one file. It just allows the learner to understand where the content may be presented. Um, of course, I also have my course calendar on Canvas, but just that one single document makes it easy for students to understand that or learners to understand that this is where you can find all the course content in one file. Um, listing descriptions um, of learning activities with consistency throughout all your learning materials. Um, and this has been something that I've just come to realize is that it's very easy to uh, miss information or share incorrect information if um, I personally am not copy and pasting from one single document. So I'm trying to replicate content in various places. So um, the most important thing for me in my practice is to describe my learning activities in my um, course syllabus and then ensuring that I'm properly copy and pasting to the learning management system. Um, it is also important to clarify what's required and what's optional. Um, I'm the kind of person that likes to provide significant number of additional resources. And um, it can be overwhelming if students don't know what absolutely they have to read or access versus what they can do on their own time, maybe after uh, the semester has passed or that module has been completed. And then, uh, when possible, provide uh, relevant examples or a rubric for an assignment. Um, again, providing relevant examples is not something that I personally can always do because I'm always thinking of creative, creative ways in which I can assess my students. So I may not have um, a relevant example to provide, but I'm, I'm probably going to have a rubric that they can use to guide their um, performance in the assessment. Now, um, accessibility is, um, I wanna say a hot topic these days. I think it's a good thing that it's a hot topic. We need more conversations of accessibility, um, but there's always um, a minor myth that is related to accessibility. And is that addressing accessibility is something that we do with people with disabilities. Um, but the reality is that accessible learning materials is something that we do for all of us. Um, and I say all of us because I'd like to include myself in that conversation. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but English is not my first language. Um, and I, I'm a native Spanish speaker. And I grew up watching uh, TV and movies in English and reading um, subtitles. Um, so even today, when I watch content um, on YouTube or a movie, I really enjoy turning on the closed captions because in some sort of way, it just makes it easier for me to understand. Um, so. Yeah, so we have to um, think about those things when we are creating accessible materials. We are not just putting closed captions on videos for um, individuals who may have a visual impairment. Impairment, yes. Um, it may also be for others who may um, find it beneficial to have a closed caption, like someone like myself, whose um, English is a second language, right? Um, a few tips related to accessibility um, is to think about the uh, formatting on content in terms of um, how the hierarchy of the content is presenting and avoiding copying and pasting um, or formatting that may not be easily, easily read readable by um, 
a computer screen reader, right? Um, I don't know if you notice, but sometimes when you copy and paste from a PDF, it may not translate the same into a Microsoft Word document. So those type of things may create uh, technical issues for a screen reader. Um, so we need to keep in, that in mind. Um, also, full line justifying, it makes it look the text very nicely because in both sides, it just looks very even. But um, our natural way of reading is from left to right, on the, unless we're from a different culture, it might be differently, um, but it just makes um, this justifying just makes from really large or small spaces and sentences, which may um, you know, affect individuals reading of the content or the visual flow of the content, make it more challenging for some. Um, we also need to consider um, the size of our font. Um, I believe 14 fonts should be like the largest, um, don't quote me on that, but it should be one of the largest fonts that you should use and then 12 font for paragraph size. Um, so you don't need something super large, uh, maybe um, allow for zooming in and things like that, but we need to consider um, the size of the font that we use as well. Um, a few other accessibility tips. Um, I've already mentioned the closed captioning in um, multimedia and videos. Um, I've also seen in the last few years a huge increase on the use of alternative text, uh, which was something that I want to say maybe two years ago I wouldn't even see on social media um, and other types of platforms, but I have seen an increase of alternative text. Uh, and the nice thing is that, uh, for example, in our learning management system in Canvas, um, you can take the time to write a complete description of your image. Uh, but if you are um, the kind of person that just likes to put an image to decorate your content, you can also just say that it's a decorative um, image. So it has no, um, there's no important content that is of benefit to the learner. Um, color in text. This is a huge pet peeve for me. Um, so um, for me, it is important for the learner to have a good um, a contrast between the text and the background. Um, and sometimes text color just makes it very challenging for certain individuals to, um, to read a text. So um, I, I say be very mindful of the use of color in text um, and how the content um, in terms of contrast is presented to the learner, right? Um, even as someone without a, a significant visual impairment, uh, certain tones of gray and different colors of background make it challenging for me to read um, text on screen. Um, I was very happy to look through our university website and see that um, through OIT, you can find a significant number of resources in terms of um, making sure that your content uh, for any kind of instruction is accessible to your learners. Um, but I was even more impressed to see that um, there was um, a guide and evaluation for accessible products. So um, in terms of accessibility, we need to understand that technology is not neutral. Um, so technology is designed by individuals just like us. And at times that means that, um, you know, the technology may not be accessible to all because we are not perfect. Um, so we need to evaluate the different types of technology that we use for our classroom, for our online environments to ensure that they are um, able to be used by um, all the students uh, who are going to access it. Um, and I know that for the most part, you are probably using the learning management system, but there are other technologies that I use that help me um, have my class, so like Jamboard, uh, Padlets, uh, and things like that. So we need to get those evaluated. Um, 
So moving on to development, um, there's the instructional language that we want to consider for the um, content that we are presenting, the descriptive versus um, bullet points. Um, and you can see that the difference between the two different types of content and the bullet point, um, the information is presented in a far more organized manner, easier, easier to digest content. Uh, whereas in the descriptive language, you know, I definitely have to read to get exactly what I need to get out of it, right? So um, again, I think that the use of bullet points is something that is just going to make it easier for the learner to digest the content. Um, in terms of organization of the materials, um, my personal way of organi organizing my core content is on uh, modules. And in each module, I am likely to include my rubric, um, learning materials, readings, uh, link to external content, um, any assignments that I may have, uh, links to forums, um, sample assignments, and resources that may benefit to the learner. This is what my course may look like in a Blackboard learning management system. Um, and transitioning from Blackboard to Canvas, that was something. Um, so, um, you know, I would start with my star here, then move on to my announcements. I'm a huge proponent of announcements. Uh, meet the instructor, a link to my virtual office hours, uh, syllabus and calendar, uh, the virtual Zoom room, which we would all meet in there. Um, sometimes I would include a link to a conversation cafe in which the students could, it was more like a discussion board setting in which students post memes, uh, videos, and other resources, and then my link to my modules, points, etc. Now, looking at what it looks like in Canvas, um, I like to keep my links to what the students need um, and remove view of everything else. Please tell me if you do it differently or if it works for you better the other way. Uh, but these are the links that I, uh, my students most need access to and that's what I wanna include in there. Uh, my default front page includes information about the class, the course description and the syllabus and a little bit about me that I couldn't include in here. Now, if we transition to what my modules look like, um, again, this is where I'm going to have a meeting outline with links to resources that my students may need. Um, I may have uh, my course activity. Um, so I don't have an assignments link on the site. I have everything in the module because I like to avoid confusion. Um, so moving on to um, user experience um, and, and wrapping things up, um, communication is a very important part of um, an online course and um, things that you wanna be able to tell your students from the get-go, of course, your office hours, um, your office number, or maybe your the Zoom link where they can reach you at. And most of my students are graduate students, so they don't, they cannot come to campus, so we meet via Zoom. Um, my response time policy, I, um, I'm very upfront about that on, um, at the beginning of the course, I put it in my course syllabus. And if I have a synchronous class with my students, that's something that I discuss with them. Um, you know, within the week, I am a 24 hour kind of person. I likely respond to you. Um, there's no guarantee that I'll be able to respond on the weekends. Um, so I like to be upfront about that. Etiquette in terms of communication, do you want to have your um, course number in the subject line? Do you expect to be addressed in a specific way? So those are things that are very important to communicate with students. But in addition to that, um, there are netiquettes that I include in my class that allow for a um, more um, collaborative environment. So those netiquettes represent um, elements of respect, um, relevance, 
reciprocity, responsibility, and relationship of the students. And these are the example of the netiquettes that I tend to use. So I make sure that my students understand that um, we have to be res uh, respectful of each other's views, um, that people from different political, religious, cultural, linguistic backgrounds are coming together. And this agreement is part of the learning process, but we have to disagree within a rational, uh, with the use of rational discourse. Um, we are going to avoid swearing and profanity. Uh, we don't wanna write in all caps because we don't want anyone to think that we're shouting. Um, I do not like um, when we make assumptions. So the use of acronyms have to be spelled out. Um, also, we have to be respectful of privacy in terms of information and content that's shared online. Um, and what does that mean in terms of sharing that content in the public? So um, again, we have to treat our course content with privacy and uh, avoid any type of misinformation, be accurate and factual. Um, I mentioned this before already, but of course, providing access to resources. Um, if there are any tutorials and demos that need to be included, those should be included within your module. Um, and then um, I tend to do a, a navigation of my um, Canvas course when we first, when I first meet my students because I have a synchronous online class. But if our first meeting is not a synchronous meeting, then I'm likely to create a navigation video so that the students are aware of where they can find information within the learning management system. I'm an avid user of announcements, as I previously mentioned. And I think in this um, day and age, because we don't only access our learning management system through a desktop device, we also access it online. It's important to do a series of device testings. So I have hopefully not overwhelmed you um, and share content that you find beneficial, maybe perhaps some of the content that you already practice on your own. Um, but I'm curious to know if you have any questions or comments or recommendations. I'm always open to recommendations as well. Um, thank you everyone for listening attentively. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share a few links in the chat um, so you can have them. Uh, one of them is a link to the journal article. And another one is a link to a book that was just released yesterday. I am a co-author in a book chapter in the book and it's called uh, Critical uh, Digital Pedagogy in Higher Education. It is available um, open access and you can download the whole book for free. And it was published to Atabasca University Press. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Nilda, for a great uh, presentation. Does anyone have a comment or questions? I do if nobody is going to speak up first. I'm curious if you've had um, the way your modules are set up and um, I'm curious uh, what kind of feedback you get from your students? Are they, um, do you get excited feedback about any particular part of um, the course as they're moving through it, what they like, dislike? Uh, yeah, so I think one of the things that I've received uh, excitement about is, um, I know it sounds silly, but the use of the announcements as a sort of like repository or history of the course um, has been something that has been very well received by the students. Um, so the announcements are not just to share like, oh, we're not having class or something like that. But if we do an activity on um, during the class, like work on a Google document together, after class, I'll go and share that Google document via the announcement so that everyone can see it. 
Um, or if there's an assignment that um, I only get to see, um, then I will ask for their permission and ask them via the announcements. Like for example, one of the student, one of the tasks that the students do um, in some of the courses that I'm teaching is um, creating a professional portfolio. And normally that's something that they submit to me, but I will go ahead and share it, the links to their professional portfolios in the announcement so that everyone else can see what they have created. Um, so it's a great way to, uh, for them to create assignments that are not just for me, but for everyone to enjoy. So, so that has been a positive feedback that I've received um, in the past. Any other questions? Hey, Anilda, thank you so much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. I really liked um, kind of what you talked about at the beginning about uh, using critical pedagogy to elevate voices or kind of change the paradigm so that it's not so one-sided. And so I'm um, seeking your advice on something that I experienced in one of my courses. I, I love that you talked about Jamboard and, and Flipgrid. And those are actually two technologies that I utilized um, in, a, in a class this fall. And um, it, it, while it ended up working out well, and we got to the point where the students were comfortable utilizing it, and in fact, by the end of course survey, they expressed how they, how they enjoyed it. Um, it was kind of slow sledding at start, and there was almost like a sense of like, what on earth do you want me to do? Why aren't you just like talking at me or lecturing at me? And so it, it, it led me to kind of realize that there's like some expectation setting sometimes, like, like students don't ne necessarily always enter the classroom ready to like have their voice heard. And so I'm just curious if you've experienced that at all and, and what you do to kind of set students up for success with that expectation that this is going to be a space in which we are going to be hearing from each other. Um, how have you navigated that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, coming into a classroom with the expectation of participation. Um, I think that sometimes it may be beneficial to um, set it up as a requirement um, and, you know, kind of like generate that interest through, you know, well, there are some points that you may acquire here uh, through this activity. And that sometimes leads to um, engagement without necessarily the requirement. Um, but then I think that there's also the opportunity for like um, a natural source of engagement. Um, I was having a conversation with some colleagues about this, and I don't know if it's necessarily always to expect um, a continuous level of participation. Um, so uh, and we were calling it like a silence as pedagogy. Uh, <laughs> So, I mean, sometimes we, we get nervous with silence or low participation, uh, but it not necessarily meaning that the students are not are acquiring the content that they need. Um, so I think that um, it depends on what you aim to create off the activity. Uh, do you want it to be more of a natural participation? Or do you feel like that's an absolute requirement for the learner to engage on? Um, I don't know if I have a full like answer to it, but <laughs> uh, just reflection on it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And I definitely have some internal work to do to feel more comfortable with silence uh, in, in the classroom because <laughs> I, I tend to like to, to fill that silence. So thank you. Uh, if I may add to that, Josh, uh, I think about Eight years ago, I I remember doing some research on the pedagogy of silence, right, in the classroom. Well, in this case, it's in face-to-face -face class, right? And so usually you have students who are silent in the class, but it doesn't mean that they are not engaging, right? Some of them just prefer just not to, uh, don't have the, the, the engage, don't demonstrate the engagement that we want them to demonstrate. And, and so, and if you in, in today, if you think about that from perhaps a UDL perspective, right, taking into account uh, the 
each learner's uh, learning preference, for example, right? Those who may choose not to engage the way you want them to, including writing on Jamboard or, you know, uh, engaging in live discussions. Maybe they are engaging, but then in their own ways, right? But, you know, again, pedagogy of silence, so. <laughs> And I was going to say also, there are um, students who may engage with the content, but there may be lurkers in other types of environment. I've always been very interested in lurkers in online communities because um, just from like reading, like eager, um, just reading about it, it, there's like so much capital that may not translate back to the online environment, but it may translate to a face-to-face -face environment. Um, so for example, in the conversation cafes that I would put on my online course, for sure, I thought everybody was just going to jump on it and share their memes and share their videos and share everything. And it was like three students that did that. Um, and everybody else was just, they would see it, they would just not comment or add to it. So um, so yeah, so I think balancing that active online participation versus students what, getting what they need to get out of the course, but not necessarily be those super um, sharers in the class. Yeah, so. Okay. Uh, Douglas says that's me. <laughs> <laughs> any other comments um what about the learning objectives part i'm kind of curious you know just because i saw it online and led to conversation uh, that i saw uh, on twitter what do other things about learning objectives do you always share your learning objectives i feel like i am one of those that doesn't I do. We do, but we kind of have to. Like it's in our syllabus, and I try to make that as explicit as I can when we're introducing new concepts because I know what it was like as a student. And it's like, what do I need to know? Because there's often a disconnect between what we want them to know and then what our testing modality is. So, like, we're teaching you this, we want you to know this. We're going to ask you some to, to perform totally different on test. So I try to get them to be like, look, this is why we're having you do this exercise. This is what we're testing you on. This is why we want you to know it. So, but that that can be really, really hard. And like, I forget all the time to do that. So, but I, I, I like that SMART acronym. I think I'm going to start, I'm, I'm going to steal that. Uh, okay. Borrow, borrow, <laughs> adopt best practices. Awesome. Thank you, Douglas. I so, absolutely do in my math classes. Um, and I actually refer to the list of learning objectives, um, specifically while we're preparing for exams. Like I want them to, after they've learned the material, go be able to go back to their homework and, you know, things that they had problems with, identify which learning objective that's related to so that the, and it just helps them like see the scaffold of work that is supporting what they're supposed to be doing on these it's basically it helps them understand what they are missing or what they need to work on so I absolutely depend on sharing those with the students awesome thank you Shell. I'm glad I'm I'm seeing a trend here so I think I need to jump on that wagon <laughs> Um, go ahead, Derek. Um, with the designs that I've done when I was teaching, uh, very similar to Shell, uh, I always share course outcomes, but then also too, um, like you are like a module design. And so at the modular level, we'll take and identify which of those are being addressed in that module so that students know exactly what they're working on. But then also to go a step further and break them down into milestones just for that module. And that way they understand it creates even more of that in-depth scaffolding. 
um, to the point too that you can even use assignments. Uh, you know, this assignment relates to course outcome A, course outcome B. Yeah, and um, I've seen that done in a few classes and in some of the programs that I took. Um, they were like that, and it's something that I've held on to because it was really effective for me. Thank you, Derek. Josh, I see your comments about the alignment map. Have others used an alignment map before, alignment table? Jason, I see you shaking your head. Yes, okay, that's good. And Chell as well. Yeah, yeah and that's, that's what I'm trying standard, to yeah. Sorry. Yeah, trying to figure out how I, I kind of want to share that with my students as well, but I I haven't found a way that's not overwhelming. So Derek, I'm super interested to know because it sounds like you almost had that alignment mapping. Uh yeah. So I'm very curious to know how you did that. <laughs> <laughs> how you presented it in a way that maybe you think is not overwhelming or uh. Yeah, I was just going to say we use it in our design process, but the students never see it, though. It's just behind the scenes, our own kind of being able to think and making sure everything, uh, everything connects. Thank you. Yeah, I think, Shell, I think that that's the key is to be able to present it without um, overwhelming the students. And I think that uh, that's the challenging part. Maybe that's why Jason says that is in the background, but not something that is presented to uh, the students never see it. So maybe Derek can be our next speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Here I am volunteering people. Right. Do we have any other questions or comments? <clears throat> we have about four minutes left. Well, I'm using the pedagogy of silence here, giving you time to think, <laughs> ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if there are no more questions, uh, I would like to thank you again, Elizabeth, for the great presentation today. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Our next brown bag is on February 10th, and I hope to see you then. Have a great thank, beginning. Thank you, everyone.